you might think that February 2nd, Groundhog Day, would be the day that we celebrate our nation's weather forecasters. But actually, National Weather Persons Day occurs three days later on February 5th and celebrates people who've helped to develop a science that is today far more accurate than the predictions of Puxitani Phil. And by coincidence, National Weather Persons Day comes on a day that is particularly notable in the history of weather. A day that deserves to be remembered. Weather forecasting has traditionally been the butt of jokes. Who else but the weather person gets paid? To be wrong, half the time. So the joke goes. But of course the accuracy and timeliness of weather forecasting has greatly improved in recent decades. And studies have repeatedly demonstrated that investments in weather forecasting reap benefits. A 2018 article in the journal Science points out that modern 72-hour predictions of hurricane tracks are more accurate than 24-hour forecasts were 40 years ago, and a modern 5-day forecast is as accurate as a 1-day forecast in 1980. We have much to thank the diligent people who helped to forecast our weather for. After all, most people, the authors note, wouldn't dream of planning an outdoor activity without first checking the weather forecast. It isn't clear exactly when the concept of what was originally called National Weatherman's Day began. The National Day calendar only says that the day has been celebrated for more than four decades. The earliest reference that I was able to find in a newspaper was in 1979. But while it isn't clear when February 5th became National Weather Person's Day, the reason for February 5th is well documented. The National Weather Service website explains the day commemorates the birth of John Jeffries, one of America's first weather observers, in 1744. Born in Boston on February 5th, Jeffries attended Harvard University, graduating in 1763. From there he traveled abroad, receiving a medical degree from the University of Aberdeen in 1769. In addition to being one of the leading surgeons in British North America, he was keen on studying the weather and began taking daily weather observations in Boston in 1774, continuing until March of 1776 when his observations were interrupted by the American War for Independence. Jeffries was a loyalist. He served with the British Army during the war, but in 1779 he moved to the United Kingdom, where he engaged in two extraordinary balloon flights. The website Celebrate Boston explains, In 1784 he made the first balloon voyage over London, dropping cards of greeting to admiring friends below. The ascent was made for scientific study of the air at high levels, and not solely for spectator purposes. Jeffries carried with him a reliable barometer, a thermometer of special make, a, a hygrometer, an electrometer, a mariner's compass, and seven small bottles for obtaining samples of air at different heights. He reached an elevation certainly exceeding 6,560 feet, and his observations were turned over to the Royal Society to be discussed and they were analyzed by no less a chemist than Cavendish. Then, on January 7th, 1785, about five weeks after the London ascent, Jeffreys crossed the English Channel, leaving the cliffs of Dover and landing with his aeronaut in the forest of Guines in Artois, near the field of the Cloth of Gold. This flight, to gather meteorological data, was the first manned balloon flight across the English Channel. Jeffries returned to Boston in 1790, resumed both his medical practice and his practice of taking daily weather observations until his death in 1816. Celebrate Boston says of his weather observations, they were in the library of the Blue Hill Meteorological Observatory and are greatly prized as authentic climatic data. According to the National Weather Service, National Weather Persons Day is a day to recognize the men and women who collectively provide Americans with the best weather water and climate forecasts and warning services of any nation. The National Day calendar also lists February 5th as National Shower with a Friend Day, which is described as a tongue-in-cheek way to help people realize the benefits of filtered, chlorine-free water. I'm sure you can come up with your own way to celebrate that particular day, but National Weather Forecasters Day is particularly apropos because February 5th has seen some extraordinary weather. San Francisco, because of its location along the coast and its low elevation relative to sea level, very rarely sees snow. In fact, the newspaper SF Gate writes that snow has only settled in the downtown area of San Francisco five times in recorded history. Interestingly, two of the five times, in 1887 and in the most recent snowstorm accumulating at least an inch downtown in 1976, that snow fell on February 5th. 
As odd as snowfall is in San Francisco, it didn't seem to cause a great public disturbance in 1887. The Oakdale Graphic reported that residents of San Francisco awoke this morning to meet a sight which proved to be as enjoyable to many as it was unexpected and surprising to all. While noting that a great conflagration or earthquake would not have more greatly excited people throughout the residence portion of the city, the paper reports that street car travel was interrupted to some extent early in the day owing to snow in the tracks, but otherwise no inconvenience or damage resulted. There was marginally more difficulty in 1976. The San Francisco Examiner reported a major traffic pileup when two trucks jackknifed and another 20 car pileup caused by ice, snow, and fog. Apparently, changes in transportation meant that the city had become even more vulnerable to the effects of snow than it had been 89 years before. But residents reacted with much the same delight. The example reports that snowball fights erupted out of several city bars. Youngsters darted out of their homes last night and started playing in the rare snow. They also, in 1976, recognized the irony of the timing. The examiner wrote that three and a half inches of snow made it the second heaviest fall in all weather history for San Francisco. By coincidence, the record was on this same date, February 5th, 1887. The 1976 storm was significant enough to also cause two inches to accumulate in Sacramento, which the Weather Service notes was the first accumulated snowfall in California's capital city since 1941. Two inches might be a lot of snow for Sacramento, but it's hardly a record for February 5th. For example, a blizzard in Iran between February 3rd to the 8th, 1972, killed an estimated 4,000 people. It was the deadliest blizzard in world history. Mental Foss explains, coming on the heels of a series of storms in late January, the blizzard of 1972 traveled through western Iran and into Azerbaijan from about February 3rd to February 8th, dropping up to 26 feet of snow. That's a two-and-a-half-story building worth of snowfall and snapping telephone lines, bearing commuter trains, entombing villages and crushing cars in its wake. Thousands of villagers in remote areas were snowbound. The Associated Press reported that rescuers trying to reach 100 trapped villagers in the village of Sheklabad, buried under 8 feet of snow, reached the hamlet apparently too late to save any of its inhabitants. And reports said at least six bulldozers had been lost as they sank into ravines while trying to clear railways and highways in Azerbaijan and central Iran. The UK newspaper The Express talked last year about why the storm was so deadly. Thousands of Iranians opted to stay indoors as the blizzard wreaked havoc outside. But for many, the weather turned their homes into freezing death traps. Temperatures plunged so low that many who died at the hands of the storm were not found until the snow had thawed away, unearthing the true extent of the weather's destruction. Sky and Weather.net explains that the few people who survived the snow and storm also died in the minus 30 degree cold and in the absence of water, food, heating equipment, and medical aid, as well as the spread of influenza. February 5th, 1978 represents the beginning of a historic three-day nor'easter that struck the American nor'east. The storm set snowfall records in Boston, Providence, and Atlantic City. The Associated Press reported the storm disrupted virtually every facet of life for millions. Not only did the storm shut down commerce over virtually the entire northeastern United States, but it killed 100 people. The storm was so severe that the Associated Press reported that one-third of Bostonians lost power and a state of emergency was declared across southern New England, and the National Guard was called out. About 10,000 guardsmen were mobilized in Massachusetts alone. In 2023, the Boston Herald called the blizzard of 1978 the benchmark of all winter storms, reporting that more than 1,700 single-family dwellings were destroyed or suffered major damage. The Red Cross provided shelter for more than 39,000 people who were stranded or forced from their homes by the storm. Massachusetts estimated the loss from the storm at $500 million. It wasn't the first powerful February nor'easter to paralyze the region. According to the Weather Service, a nor'easter in 1920 dropped 17 and a half inches in Central Park in three days, starting on February 5th. The International News Service reported that the blizzard brought traffic to a standstill in New York City. Huge drifts blocked side streets and streetcar traffic and foot traffic in the main thoroughfares was almost impossible at many places. Traffic was likewise stalled in Boston, where the sick are hit particularly hard by the storm, as is believed that deaths will result through the inability of physicians to get to their patients. Nor'easters generally come from the Atlantic, but the 2010 Snowmageddon came from the Pacific, 
striking from the Baja Peninsula on February 2nd and striking the U.S. Mid-Atlantic and East Coast February 4th to the 6th. The National Weather Service writes that this massive winter storm brought flooding and landslides to Mexico, drenching rain and thunderstorms across the Deep South, heavy snowfall in the southern Appalachians, and snowfall rates of up to 1 to 3 inches per hour in parts of the Mid-Atlantic. What was most notable about the storm was the enormous amount of snow. The Weather Service writes, dubbed both Snowmageddon and Snowpocalypse, the storm was one for the history books. It dropped the heaviest single storm snowfall ever recorded at Washington's Dulles International Airport, a whopping 32.4 inches. It also produced the second heaviest snowfall in Philadelphia, 28.5 inches, and the fourth heaviest at Washington's Reagan National Airport at 17.8 inches. Ten years later, those records still stand. Four or more inches of snow stretched from Indiana to New Jersey, southwards through North Carolina. One to two feet of snow were common in southern Pennsylvania, southern New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, and northern Virginia. Measurable snow fell as far north as New York, as far south as Georgia. Snow is not the only risk in February. On February 5, 1986, a supercell thunderstorm struck the Houston area, which the National Weather Service writes, produced four tornadoes, along with damaging microburst winds and up to tennis ball size hail. Police Chief Derwood Kennedy of the town of Tumble, north of Houston, told the Associated Press, We've had so many houses hit that we don't know how many, and that power lines are down by the hundreds, and hail was so severe that it was ankle deep in some places. The tornadoes killed two, including 81-year-old Barbara Wilkerson, killed when a tornado struck a mobile home park in northwestern Harris County. A resident of the park told the Associated Press that it looked like a bomb was set off in the middle out there. The storms injured 80, caused significant property damage. The Weather Service writes that much of the more substantial hail was propelled by 60 to 80 mile per hour winds, resulting in widespread moderate damage. The total damage from the storm was $80 million. While tornadoes tend to be thought of as a summer phenomenon, that is not entirely the case. On February 5, 2008, a tornado super outbreak occurred across the American South into the Ohio Valley. Occurring on the day when 24 U.S. states were holding presidential primary elections, the Super Tuesday tornado outbreak spawned, according to the National Weather Service, at least 64 tornadoes, as well as damaging wind gusts and hail up to 4.5 inches from Texas to Ohio and West Virginia. The Associated Press reported that one man pulled a couch over his head. Bank employees rushed into the vault. A woman trembled in her bathroom, clinging to her dogs. College students huddled in their dormitories. It was the nation's deadliest barrage of twisters in almost 23 years. As daylight illuminated widespread destruction, the AP writes, emergency and cleanup crews began looking for bodies and clearing away the splinters of homes and communities in Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas, and Alabama. Storms killed 59 ranking it among the top 15 deadliest tornado outbreaks in American history. And Mother Nature hasn't given up on February 5th. This February 5th, the state of California is facing several warnings in the face of an incoming atmospheric river, with ABC News saying that the forecast is for this to be one of the most severe storms in the state's history, or produce several flood warnings, high wind warnings, high surf advisories, and winter storm warnings. And if anything... The severe weather that seems to be drawn to this part of February will help us to appreciate the people we celebrate on National Weather Persons Day. Are you a fan of forgotten history? Well, if so, why don't you consider supporting us on our page on Patreon, patreon.com slash thehistoryguy, where even a small monthly donation can go a long way towards helping us to continue to produce episodes about history that deserve to be remembered. Patrons on Patreon get early access to some episodes, some exclusive content, and even possibly a History Guy Challenge coin. Join today. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.